third session of the the summer course on Islam 2021, hosted by the Karun Masidama Committee and supported by the uh, incorporated trustees of the Islamic Community Fund of Hong Kong. Today's speaker is going to be brother, uh, sorry, Professor Salim Ben Said. Brother is he good. currently an assistant professor at the National Sun Yat Sun University in Taiwan and is also a teacher of Tajweed. Tajweed is how we recite the Quran in a perfect manner and has delivered an online course recently for our attendees, which is online available on YouTube. The link has been posted to our WhatsApp group. Now, if you haven't, if you're not in the WhatsApp group, please register. I'll post the link to register here soon. It is really recommended that you register. Aside from having a certificate, if you attend more than 70% of the courses, you would also have access to our WhatsApp group where we regularly post the recordings of every single session as well as PDF of every PowerPoint that is used and other resources that you might need. It is also an open forum for you to ask questions about Islam to learn. Now that the introduction is out of the way, um, Professor Ben, sorry, mm -hmm. Professor Salim, please begin. Okay, Bismillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Rabbi sharah li sadri wa yassir li amri wa hlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli. Assalamu alaikum. Hello everyone. Greetings to all of you, all the people who joined this uh, Zoom meeting. Thank you so much for Brother Raza and Brother Adnan for coordinating this and for kindly inviting me. Um, in fact, this is my second time speaking um, um, for the Da'wah Committee of the Kalman Mosque and it's also on the same topic. Prophet Muhammad, but last time we covered a different angle. Um, all right, so let's get started, inshallah. Uh, first of all, I'd like to see or confirm that you can actually look at my screen. Um, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes. Okay. And I'd like to make this session more or less interactive, uh, meaning that in case you have questions, please feel free to stop me and ask your questions. Sometimes I may I may ask you questions. Sometimes there will be real questions. Sometimes there will be rhetorical questions. And if you have any issues with the sound, you just let me know. Huh? There's, I have a fan in the background, so I realize that sometimes it may be noisy. All right, so Bismillah, let's get started. Uh, today we're going to talk about the history of Prophet Muhammad. Uh, Prophet Muhammad, you can see the letters P, B, U, H. Uh, usually Muslims, uh, we honor the Prophet by Every time we mention his name, we say peace and blessings be upon him. And in Arabic, uh, it's Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As you can see in this nice little, um, I don't know how to call that kind of medallion or um, in the calligraphy that summarizes peace be upon him. And as a matter of fact, we always mention this peace be upon him whenever there is a name of a prophet mentioned. For instance, we say, Jesus, peace be upon him. Moses, peace be upon him. David, peace be upon him. So we respect and honor all the prophets uh, equally. So uh, without further ado, let's have a look at today's um, outline. But before that, um, because today we are basically scratching the surface, honestly. I, I cannot even begin to um, talk about uh, the prophet's life or biography, um, I'm going to suggest to you something. I'm going to suggest to you a biography that uh, you can consult yourselves and you can go and dig deeper and further if you are interested in uh, the life of the prophet, be upon him. And this is one of the best biographies out there. Uh, it's called The Sealed Nectar, Ar-Rahiq al maktum in Arabic. And uh, many people recognize this as a really authoritarian, uh, authoritative um, bi biography. Um, and uh, I've actually tried to um, provide a snapshot of some of the reviews out there. Oh yeah, there you go. Brother Raza is showing you his own copy. <laughs> I used to have one, the same as that one. And I lent it to someone, but he didn't return it to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll just give it, I'll just give it a sadaqah, you know, to that person. So um, brothers and sisters and my friends out there, just please check this biography out. It is an amazing biography. It's very, uh, really authentic biography. Okay. Now, if you see, um, sometimes I'd like to, sh to show you a few 
beautiful um, art, calligraphy art. I know Chinese culture has also the art of calligraphy, but this is the name of Prophet Muhammad. Muhammad, uh, here, Meem, Ha, another Meem, and then this is Da. And this says, peace be upon him. This part says, peace be upon him. I don't know if you can follow the, the pointer of my mouse, but this part is, peace be upon him. Yeah, we can follow the cursor, yeah. Oh, great, great. All right, so my outline for today, I'm basically following the outline provided to us. Um, I'm going to divide my uh, short talk in four parts. First of all, we will talk about Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a spiritual leader. Then we will go and cover the aspect of statesman. He was an excellent statesman. Par excellence is a French word meaning excellent. Par excellence. I like that choice of words. Then we will talk about a teacher. And I think, and I think we, um, we are uh, always inspired by our teachers, right? We always have teachers uh, as role models. And he was one of the best teachers. We will look at that in details. And finally, we will talk about his mercy, a prophet of mercy. Okay, so first, starting with the first section, a spiritual leader. All right. So his role as a spiritual leader is shown to us or is made evident first and foremost by the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we know? God, Allah in Arabic, has stated in the holy book, in the holy Quran, in chapter 33, verse 21, I will read for you the Arabic. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا Indeed, in the Messenger of Allah, you have an excellent example. An excellent example for whoever has hope in Allah and the last day and remembers Allah often. Now, this translation, an excellent example, in other translations, we have another word provided, a pattern, a pattern. So, and we know that the meaning of a pattern is something to be followed, something to be emulated, something that can inspire us, or a, a model, an ideal to follow. So this already, uh, by the words of God, there is an evidence that the Prophet is in fact a model for all Muslims to follow. And when we think of Islam as a system, as a complete way of life, and the Quran as the revelation of God through Angel Gabriel to the Messenger, to the Messenger, in fact, um, if we think about Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was required as a person to show us how this religion was to be practiced. In a way, I like to say that he was the um, how to or the guide or the guidance of how to practice this faith. So for instance, um, if you have a theoretical apparatus, if you, if you want to learn how to drive, right? Sorry, I had to cut my mic because there's a little bit background uh, noise. Um, so if you, for instance, want to learn how to drive, um, you cannot just read the driver's manual, the theoretical driver's manual, and then say, I actually know how to drive now, right? That's pretty impossible. But you need someone to teach you how to practice your driving. You need um, an instructor or a teacher, as we will say later, someone who will show you how things are done. And Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he was that, he was exactly that. He was the person who embodied uh, the practice of the faith. Um, one cannot understand and practice this system that is Islam without a guide or a leader. 
in that sense, the role of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was the spiritual leader who embodied Islam, who actually, through his daily interactions, through his daily behavior, through his daily acts, was the uh, praxis of Islam. Now, um, let me just move this a bit. Okay, so how did he do that? Well, we can say that most of the Prophet's missions consist in two things when they interact with people. They are there to answer their existential questions. So for instance, if a prophet is with the people he was sent to, he will answer their questions about why are we here? Why do we need to be accountable? Where do we go from here? Um, will, there be, will there be a judgment? What happens when we die? So all of these existential WH questions, what, where, when, why, how, they are to be answered by those prophets, right? But at the same time, with this, um, you know, existential uh, spiritual role of the prophets, there is a very practical role that prophets also fulfill. That is to teach them to worship, teach them to practice their faith in terms of things which are really mundane or maybe very, very trivial. For instance, uh, rights of heritage, uh, things about um, how to deal with family, how to deal with, you know, uh, people who actually um, um, maybe how to fast, how to pray, how to behave in terms of economic transactions, uh, trade, etc. Those also were taught by the Prophet. He was a leader in that sense because the Quran as a system, um, you, cannot, you cannot actually just read it and understand it by yourself. You need someone to show you how to practice the faith. So first, that's number one. He was a spiritual reader in the sense that he helped people to to live the to live Islam on a daily basis by showing uh, how it's done. Okay. Um, and as a spiritual leader, as a spiritual leader, I'm going to move this a bit. Yes, um, he stands out as a model for how to best practice the religion of Islam. This is shown to be true both by the Quran and also by his closest relatives and companions who witness, who are witnesses to that fact. So they will say, for instance, if we take an example uh, from the Quran, the Quran states, it is he, he, meaning God, who raised for the illiterate people a messenger from among themselves reciting to them his revelations, purifying them and teaching them the book and wisdom. For indeed, they had previously been clearly astray. Okay, let's pause it for a moment and explain this. Now, there are two dimensions. Uh, this, by the way, is taken from chapter 62, verse number two. There are two dimensions um, to this verse, which are important to understand what the prophet came to teach us. One, is the book. So as a spiritual leader, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came to teach, teach his people the book of Allah, the revelation, first of all, number one. Secondly, he came to teach them wisdom. Uh, some people say, what is wisdom? Well, what does wisdom consist of? In fact, it's his way of life. His sunnah, is the wisdom. So the practice of the book through the person of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, constitutes the wisdom. For instance, um, he would say to people, if you have nothing good to say, stay silent. That is one pearl of wisdom. Okay, that I know that, all right. So in fact, through his teachings, through his interactions, he would teach them the way of life as inspired from the book of Allah. So the book, Quran, revelation from God and the wisdom, the enactment of the book or the, how to say, praxis 
of the book through the body, the embodiment of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Um, if you don't know uh, this, but uh, Aisha is um, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. She was the youngest wives uh, of the wives of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And uh, as a matter of fact, she was, because of her fresh memory, she was one of the people who transmitted the largest numbers of narrations. So there is kind of a wisdom there uh, why uh, his wife Aisha, being a young wife, actually kept so much of the memory of the Prophet Wasallam, And she conveyed to us through narrations and transmission some of the largest corpus of narrations of the life of the Prophet. And she says in one of the narrations, she says, Aisha, this is the Arabic for Aisha. And we call her Ummul Mu'mineen, the mother of believers. All of the wives of the prophets, we consider them to be the, the mothers of, our, our, of us, our mothers, the mother of the believers. Radiallahu anha, here at the bottom, may Allah be pleased with her. So she says, as a report here, there was one of the companions called Qatada. And Qatada, came to Aisha and he reported, he said, I said to Aisha, this is Qatada speaking, I said to Aisha, O mother of the believers, tell me about the character of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. Tell me about the character of the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, or peace and blessings be upon him. Aisha said, have you not read the Quran? So Qatada replies back, yes, of course, I have read the Quran. Aisha said, indeed or verily, the character of the Prophet of Allah was the Qur'an. So this was is the equal sign. Prophet's character equals Qur'an. Some people say he was a walking Qur'an. So he was, as a spiritual leader, he embodied the values. He embodied whatever was taught in the Qur'an, that was the Prophet. That was actually the enactment of the Qur'an. So uh, this is another hint of how the Prophet, peace be upon him, was actually a religious spiritual leader that taught his people through his acts, not taught only through the sayings, but through the doings. Teaching by doing, not just by saying. And this source is Sahih Muslim. If you're not familiar, I'll just briefly tell you. In addition to the Quran, which is the book of Allah, there's a book a few books of narrations that compile the stories of the Prophet's sayings, what he related, what he said, as reported from companions of the Prophet. Okay, let's go now to our second uh, dimension of the Prophet's life, peace be upon him. In addition to being a spiritual leader, he was a statesman par excellence, an excellent statesman. Now, Today, I'm going to spend some time talking about something. But first, before I do that, I want to ask you a question. So here's where we're going to have a little bit of an interaction. Have you heard about this word, hijra, before? No, no, it's open floor for people to talk or ask questions or say, oh, I know this word. I've heard this word before. Yeah, you can feel free to unmute yourselves. You could use the chat box to respond as well, like last oh, time. Oh, yes, we have a chat box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you know what this word means, hijra? Well, you have kind of a hint with the image, but it's not that obvious, to be honest. <laughs> oh, Mariam <laughs> says it means Ali. migration. Okay, and then excellent. Annie says the year they moved to Medina. Whoa. So Mariam and Annie, two sisters, two ladies, mashallah. Where yeah. are the boys? Where are the men? Where are the gentlemen? <laughs> okay, that's excellent. So we have both good answers here. We have migration and then the beginning of the Islamic calendar. Very good. So what happened is that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the beginning of his, um, you know, uh, conveying of the message of Allah, of transmitting Islam, um, he was living in uh, Mecca first. And then he experienced hardships, right, as many prophets do. But uh, what happened is that through that experience, conveying the messenger of Islam, this uh, uh, persecution became more intense. And then there was a fear for his life. So what happened is that he migrated 
he made a hijrah, what we call a hijrah, a migration, from Mecca to Medina. And that constituted the beginning of the Islamic calendar. The year zero of the Islamic calendar is the year of hijrah of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So um, hijrah in Arabic means migration, but also now metaphorically, it came to mean uh, something also for us as Muslims, if we do our hijrah, as a Muslim is that we feeling um, our religion being threatened, we will make migration for the sake of Allah. If for instance, for instance, we live in a land where our religion or our practice is being jeopardized, is being endangered, is being um, put at risk, then we will make that hijrah, we migrate to another land, or we make a hijrah spiritual or mentally that we, we choose actually not to indulge in a society that has excesses. So that, that has more metaphorical meanings as well. Okay, so let's go and thank you for uh, the reactions of the two participants, very good. So first of all, I'm going to keep a little uh, corner rectangle on the top left called Sulh al this is in Arabic, Sulh al I'm going to explain to you, right? Don't worry, I'm not just using Arabic randomly there. Um, the Arabic, Sulh al hudaybiyah is the meaning uh, translated in English as the treaty or the truce of Hudaybiyah. And this is a prime example or a very good illustration of why Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was an excellent statesman. So because Today's uh, lecture is only one hour and a half. I cannot go over too many examples, but I want to use a nice example here to, ex to explain why this incident or this event constituted an excellent example of his statesmanship, or rather of his excellent statesmanship. So um, let me show you a map. This is contemporary Saudi Arabia. Uh, I didn't have a map of the times of the Prophet, peace be upon him, but you know, Pretty much the cities are the same location. And I did the Google map uh, walking, walking, uh, you know, uh, itinerary from Mecca down south to Medina north to show you the Hijrah, right? It takes, it's about 523 kilometers away and it would take you 170 hours walking there, okay? They didn't have automobiles, they didn't have planes at that time, they had camels, what we call Safina to Sahara, the vessel of the desert. Uh, nonetheless, it would take a few days uh, to reach Medina. Now, let's explain what happened during this uh, Hudaybiyah. And, and Hudaybiyah, as you can see, is in the outskirts of Mecca, outside Mecca a little bit, right? So when the Prophet made the Hijrah, he was far from Mecca, right? All right. So. Uh, when migrating or making hijrah to Medina, it's also spelled Medina, M-E-D-I-N-A, uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not conquer the city of Medina, but was welcomed by the population. So there was not an invasion. When he moved to Medina, he was welcomed by the people. In fact, Islam had already reached Medina before the hijrah of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the Med Medinans had converted freely out of their own free will. He, were, he had won them over already before reaching Medina. So Medina was already a Muslim city. It was already fully uh, converted to Islam. Of course, there were other uh, people who practiced other faiths. For instance, there were Jewish people there who practiced uh, Judaism, but they were living together. And then six years after Hijrah or after having left Mecca for Medina and settled in Medina, due to the persecution, persecution that I told you about, the Prophet decided it was time to go back to Mecca to perform a pilgrimage, the small pilgrimage of Umrah. Now remember, Mecca was already a religious center. Before Islam, people used to go there to perform pilgrimage, but their pilgrimage was a polytheistic type of pilgrimage where they had idol worshiping, they used to do circumambulation of the, the, the Kaaba, where there were lots of idols there. And people used to come from different corners of the world to do pilgrimage, but it was not, um, you know, celebrating a monotheistic uh, faith, but more than, more rather a polyste, polyste, polytheist uh, faith. So the Prophet decided to take volunteers 
and to go back to the arch enemies of Islam uh, represented by a tribe called the Quraysh tribe. And he said, it's time now to go back and to peacefully try to do or perform the pilgrimage. What happened? Meccans refused. The Meccans said, no, you will not. You will not do it. We won't let you. So this resulted in the treaty or the truce of Hudaybiyah, where we are going to have an illustration of the Prophet, peace be upon him, excellent uh, leadership roles. So what happened is that I'm going to summarize this treaty a bit because otherwise it will be too long. So he took a convoy of uh, 1400 Muslims to Hudaybiyah and they were wearing their ihram, which is actually is made up of two simple pieces of white cloth covering the, the top part and the bottom and they didn't have weapons. So they were very vulnerable. And they went and uh, went on their way to uh, Mecca to perform the pilgrimage. However, the Meccans heard about it, the Qurayshi tribe heard about it. And they sent a convoy of armed, uh, um, you know, uh, horsemen to intercept them. So at, um, at some point there was a resolution whereby the Prophet, peace be upon him, met with an envoy of the Quraysh in order to try to solve or ease down the tension and try to work things out. Why? Because now imagine the Prophet came without weapons with 1400 Muslims and they were just wearing the garments of Ihram for performing pilgrimage. Now, had the Meccans attacked, had the Meccans attacked the Prophet and the Muslims, they would have received a lot of blame from all the Arab tribes around the cities of Mecca and Medina, saying that how could you attack someone who is who is vulnerable and who is actually uh, without arms, without weapons? So. They would have uh, the Meccans would have received a lot of blame. So in fact, the smart uh, act of the Prophet is to go and corner the Meccans into uh, forcing them into a treaty. So he knew he was actually predicting that uh, the Meccans had no other choice but to reach a consensus or an agreement. So after discussing and agreeing, they came up with four conditions to peace. So it's a condition of this treaty. First of all there will be a secured peace for 10 years. No fighting between the Muslims and the people who rejected the prophet disbelievers for 10 years. There will be a truce for 10 years. Point number one. That's quite positive. Point number two is not so positive for the Muslims. It's a one-sided extradition. Uh, what does it mean? It means that in case Muslims um, who are with the Prophet decide to leave Islam and go to Mecca, they will be not returned to the Prophet. But in case someone from Mecca leaves Islam and uh, uh, enters Islam and goes to join Medina, he will be returned to Mecca. <laughs> so it's unfair, right? So it's not a win-win situation. The second one is more like a win for the Meccans twice. Okay, so the third uh, condition of this treaty is that Muslims will return to Medina the following year. So imagine the Prophet came with all these 1,400 people to perform pilgrimage, but then they said to them, no, sorry, you're not gonna do it this year. You have to return next year. So the Prophet accepted to that condition, right? It's hard performing this journey of 500 kilometers and then having to return without performing the pilgrimage. So they said, okay, we will do that. And then um, this was actually uh, also a negative condition for the Muslims. The fourth and final uh, agreement was that any tribe who wants to be allied with Muslims or the Quraysh can do so. So this is fair for both. 
whoever wants to join the Muslims or to, to join the Quraysh, they can do so. Okay. Now, in spite of the largely disadvantages conditions for the Muslims, this treaty was considered a victory for the Muslims. It was largely considered to be a victory for the Muslims. Why was it considered to be a victory? We will come back to the circled part later, but uh, just to quote the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Prophet Muhammad, indeed or verily we have granted you a manifest victory talking about this treaty of Hudaybiyah that in fact this represented a victory for the Muslims. Okay, let's talk about why it was a victory and coming back to the role of the Prophet as a statesman. Why was the Treaty of Hudaybiyah considered a victory for the Muslims? Well, first of all, prior to that treaty, prior to that time, Islam in Arabia had been an anomaly. Now, remember, you have to bear in mind that Arabia, most of Arabia was polytheist, polytheistic religion. And uh, the people of Quraysh used to um, take the pilgrimage also as a means of generating money. It was a business for them. So all the people coming from different parts of the world who came to uh, do the pilgrimage, they also spent lots of money. They also went there and stay for a few days. So uh, in fact, it was a source of money for the family, the Quraysh tribe. And Prophet Muhammad coming and saying, there is no such thing as polytheism. There's only one God that you must worship. It was actually such an earthquake for this Quraysh. He's going to ruin our business. All those people coming from different parts of the world, they want to have this polytheistic uh, pilgrimage. So why are you going to ruin that? So in fact, because of that fact, uh, Islam was an anomaly. However, after the treaty, it contributed to making Islam accepted even by the Quraysh, the fiercest of its opponents. Say, okay, we accept it. We accept that you have your faith. Let's have a peace. Let's have a peace. So that was kind of normalizing relations. Third, the climate of peace, because of that treaty, the climate of peace, which the treaty favored or contributed to, allowed people to be more exposed to the message of Islam and guaranteed a very important number of converts. So when there is peace, people are actually more keen on listening to what the prophet is saying. And then because of that factor, then people started to convert more and more. Now, just the fact, in 1630 in common era in CE, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, started um, transmitting or conveying the message of Islam. So that was the time or the date that he started spreading Islam by words, by saying, worship one God. Please listen to only one God. You must worship only one God. There is no such thing as the other divinities, no shirk. From 1613 CE in common era to 1628, this was actually the date of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. The very interesting factor is that in only a few months or even one year following the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, there were more converts to Islam than in the 15 years uh, that the Prophet spent uh, spreading the religion from 1613 to 1628. SubhanAllah, this is quite an amazing fact. Uh, so this boom in the number of converts was contributed by the peace climate or the peaceful climate that was favored by the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Um, in addition to that, the treaty also allowed the Muslims who were still in Mecca, the land of the disbelievers or the enemies of Islam to practice Islam publicly now. So they had a guarantee that they wouldn't be attacked. They had the chance for the freedom to practice their faith publicly. Uh, fifth point, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, showed statesmanship and diplomatic qualities by being far-sighted, not short-sighted. Although some of the treaty's conditions, as I showed you earlier, two of them especially, were very uh, clearly in his disfavor and in uh, the Muslims' disfavor. He was not um, discouraged by that fact, but he saw things 
at a far distance. And I will explain to you in a moment what that means. And finally, what happened is that the Quraysh promised not to attack the Muslims for 10 years, but in fact, they couldn't wait for that long. And after only two years, the Quraysh, the tribe from Mecca, they broke the treaty after two years, which actually give a legitimate reason and the backing of all the Arab tribes around to say now Muhammad has a green light, nobody will blame him if he takes over Mecca. And that's what happened. Mecca was conquered. So um, it was only in the space of two years that Mecca came back to Islam and uh, to the hands of the Muslims. So now let me explain to you uh, why the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has this uh, farsightedness and art and skill of negotiation. During the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which actually took place under a tree in the desert, under a tree, there was an envoy, uh, Suhail ibn Amr from the Quraysh, and he was very fierce. He was unyielding. He didn't want to hear anything. He was really very, very harsh in his negotiation. And at the beginning of the negotiation, they had it written down. And uh, the Prophet, peace be upon him, had Ali, his cousin, as a scribe, to write down the conditions of this treatment or this, uh, this peace treaty. And he said, Ali, write down in the name of Allah, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, to get started at the top of the page. So Suhail ibn Amr said, no, I don't understand what you mean by in the name of Allah, the most merciful. Just write Bismik Allahumma, O Allah, with your name, just for the sake of contradicting the Prophet. Uh, and then the Prophet said, okay, just do it. Just erase it and write what he wants. Bismik Allahumma. So first uh, sign of Prophet's patience, Negotiation, diplomacy, farsightedness. He didn't get angry. He said, okay, just do, just do what he wants. Let's get this treaty done. Secondly, when the prophet started writing, he said, or he, he actually gave instruction to his scribe to say, I, Muhammad, prophet of Allah, agree to the following conditions. But Suhail ibn Amr said, if you, if we recognized you as the prophet of Allah, we wouldn't be fighting you. So don't write it, write the name of your father, write Muhammad ibn Abdullah, Muhammad son of Abdullah. Don't write Muhammad prophet of Allah on this, on this uh, treaty. So as you can see, the tension is growing slowly, slowly. Every time we're reaching another threshold of tension. First, no, you are not. Don't, you're not going to write in the name of Allah. All the Muslims around listening to this are actually getting a bit mad and mad, more mad. Second threshold or layer of tension. No, you are not the prophet of Allah. Write Muhammad, son of Abdullah. And in fact, Ali said, I'm not going to erase it. I'm going to keep Muhammad uh, Rasulullah. So the prophet being illiterate, not being able to read or write, he said to him, show me where uh, Muhammad, Prophet of Allah is, show me on the paper. And Ali showed him and Prophet Muhammad erased it himself. So showing how much he was keen on being flexible. Then another step of tension is achieved when, although the Muslims were in a state of ihram, they were actually ready and they were just looking at Mecca in front of them within a few minutes walk. Um, the condition of one of the conditions as I told you earlier of this treaty is that they are not going to perform Umrah this year. They have to walk back. So that was very frustrating as you can imagine for both the Prophet peace be upon him and also for the Muslims accompanying him that he had to walk back. They had to go back. They are not going to get what they want this year. And the other condition is that they will come back next year and only stay three days. And they will stay three days without any weapons. So a lot of conditions there. So the prophet also says, or accepts these conditions and say, okay, we will accept that, no problem. But you can, you can guess how the Muslims around him <clears throat> uh, were frustrated and were probably starting to protest at this point. And then finally, this is one of the most dramatic uh, parts of this treaty 
there was um, a, a guy, there is a man called Abu Jandal. And Abu Jandal is none other than the son of uh, uh, Suhail ibn Amr, who is actually the person uh, from the Quraysh that the Quraysh sent to, to make this um, treaty, who was actually, I told you, harsh. The son of Suhail ibn uh, Amr is Abu Jandal, and he actually entered Islam. He wanted to become a Muslim. However, his father, being a non-believer or disbeliever, tortured him, and he... <laughs> He actually uh, chained him to a tree with a rope and was trying to force him to abandon the, the faith, trying to abandon the faith of Islam, saying, you must leave this faith. You, there's no way for you that you are going to become a Muslim. So what happened during this process of negotiation, because both the Muslims and the Quraysh were really, their mind were taken with the negotiation, so they didn't pay attention to uh, Abu Jandal. Abu Jandal escaped and he ran for his life. He ran for his life and joined the Muslims. And finally, when he joined the Muslims, he thought, finally, now I have converted to Islam and now I'm with the Muslims. I can actually be safe. They will take care of me. They will protect me. But uh, Suhail ibn Amr said, remember that condition, if any non-Muslim wishes to return, if any Muslims wishes to abandon Islam and return to Mecca, you will not claim him to return to you. However, if any person from us, from our tribe, wishes to enter Islam and leaves Mecca to go to Medina, you must return him to us. You must return him to us. There's no other choice. And Suhail ibn Amr said, when he saw his son, seeking protection of the Muslim, he said, this is the next condition and you must observe it. You must observe it. You must not, uh, he will not uh, go with you to Mecca. He, my son must return with me. He must return with me to, Medi uh, to Mecca. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, but Suhail, we haven't even finished the contract. We haven't even finalized the contract. Can't you actually make an exception because your son came to seek refuge and join the Muslims rank before we actually finalize this contract? Can't you just make an exception? So Suhail said, no, I will not. And I'm not going to accept this contract at all. I will not accept this contract if you don't listen to my condition. So um, the Prophet, peace be upon him, tried to negotiate with him further and further and was very kind, but still Suhail ibn Amr did not yield. So that was the condition that uh, Abu Jandal had to go back with his father, humiliated. And you can feel again that the pressure is building up and then the Muslims are protesting. They are seeing one of their new brothers enter the faith, but he has to be taken back to the disbelievers. So what happened is that Suhail ibn Amr took his son back, but they finally agreed to finalize this treaty. They agreed to finalize this treaty, which largely was in uh, the disfavor of the Muslims. However, uh, that was not counting on uh, the wisdom of the Prophet ﷺ. There was actually an interaction between um, Prophet Muhammad here in a nice medallion and Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu an, who was one of his closest companions and uh, the second khalif, the second successor after Prophet Muhammad and Abu Bakr. So Umar ibn al-Khattab was very angry and he came to the Prophet, peace be upon him, he said, how, how can we be so humiliated by this treaty? Did we really win anything from this treaty? And the conversation that ensued uh, was the following. So he came to the Prophet and he said, aren't we on the right path? The Prophet said, yes, we are on the right path. Aren't they on the wrong path? Those pagans, those disbelievers. And the Prophet said, yes, to both. And then he said, then why should we let our religion be degraded and return before Allah has settled the matter between us? Why should we return to Medina humiliated and degraded? Why can't we fight them? Why can't we take them? So Prophet Muhammad in his wisdom said, O son of Al-Khattab, because Umar ibn Khattab was called 
Omar, son of Al-Khattab, Omar ibn Al-Khattab. No doubt I am Allah's apostle and Allah will never neglect me. O oh, Omar, son of Al-Khattab, no doubt I am Allah's messenger or apostle and Allah will never neglect me. I'm going to stop a little bit because I saw a raised hand. Is there anyone who wants to ask a question? I think uh, for Farnas Sharif. Yeah. Yes. Oh, sorry, that was by mistake. Sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. So, uh, seeing the frustration of the Prophet of of Omar bin Khattab, Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam said to him, "Don't worry. I am Allah's messenger, and I will never neglect me." And then, being frustrated, he said, "But you promised us that we will perform Umrah." <laughs> You promised us that we will perform Ammara. So you know what the Prophet, peace be upon him, replied to him? In all wisdom and kindness and soft, soft speech, he said, yes, but did I promise that it will take place this year? Oh, you can imagine how infuriated <laughs> Omar was, having reached really the outskirts of Mecca and wishing to perform the Umrah, but yet having to return back and reach, uh, do all of these miles or kilometers back to Medina. Now, having no other way around this, uh, Omar bin Khattab went to talk to Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. And Abu Bakr here is the closest companion to the Prophet, peace be upon him. In fact, Aisha is the daughter of Abu Bakr, and he, she is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. And Abu Bakr was, you know, he could actually give his life and his family and parents' life for the Prophet because he loved him so much and he would listen to him to the letter. In fact, when people said, uh, revealed to Abu Bakr that the Prophet had made, had performed a night journey from uh, Masjid al-Haram al Masjid al-Aqsa from Mecca to Jerusalem on a horse overnight, uh, uh, people came to Abu Bakr and said, did you hear what your companion, what the Prophet said? your friend, he made a night journey from Mecca to Jerusalem. So Abu Bakr said, if he said so, then it is true. Showing how much trust Abu Bakr had. So let me just go back to what happened. Omar frustrated, came to Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And he said to him, Abu Bakr, he asked him the same question. So Abu Bakr was kind of a mirror or reflection of Prophet Muhammad. He said, are we not on the right path? Yes, we are said Abu Bakr. Aren't they on the wrong path, those disbelievers? And Abu Bakr said, yes, they are. And then he asked the same questions and Abu Bakr just mirrored or reflected the same answers uh, as Prophet Muhammad. And he said, didn't we get the promise from the Prophet that we are going to perform our pilgrimage this year? And Abu Bakr said, did the Prophet say that it was gonna be this year? Did he promise that it was going to be this year? He said he would, he would, you would do the pilgrimage, but it won't necessarily be this year. So he, he actually had the same reply as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So everybody was frustrated because of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, but the Prophet had been promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have a success. And in fact, he was also a little bit in his thoughts. While they were performing uh, the trip on the way back to Medina, having in a way being humiliated by the Meccans, Omar came back to his, um, you know, to his spirits and he came to the Prophet and he asked him a question and the Prophet didn't reply. And then he asked him a question a second time and the Prophet didn't reply again. And he asked a third time and the Prophet didn't reply again. So Omar felt, oh, I am lost, the Prophet is angry at me. He said, let me go away and reach the beginning of the caravan, the front of the caravan. Why? Because maybe there will be a revelation from Allah to the Prophet, peace be upon him, and then maybe this revelation will be blaming me because I've annoyed the Prophet so much with my questions. <clears throat> so he reached the front of the caravan and then, um, <laughs> A few moments later, we don't know how much, someone called Omar and said to him, the Prophet is calling you. Is calling you. 
And in fact, there was a revelation at that time. And the revelation says, In fact, this revelation says, O oh Prophet, we have granted you a clear triumph or victory. So why did the Prophet call Omar to tell him, if you hadn't believed me when I answered your questions with yes, yes, then this is coming from Allah to confirm that in fact, this treaty of Hudaybiyah is a victory for us. It is not a defeat. And you will see, time will only confirm that this has been a victory for the Muslims. So the word Fath, Fathahna Laka, Fatham Mubina is repeated twice. Fathan, Fathahna. And the word Fath means victory or opening. We have opened something, we, we have made you victorious. So it has two meanings. They are both related, in fact. And in this case, it means the opening or capturing of Mecca later after two years. So this is an anticipation of what was going to happen after two years when the Muslims would actually take over Mecca. And all of that is a follow up of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. OK, so that is the second section um, of how the Prophet, peace be upon him, was such a great statesman and his farsightedness and diplomacy. Um, was actually, even though it was not in agreement with the, the rest of the Muslims, but he knew better, he knew better. Now we're going to reach another part, which is the Prophet, peace be upon him, as a teacher. Um, how was he a teacher? Well, all uh, the prophets, in fact, the title of prophet as a teacher does not really need a justification because all the prophets are meant to be teachers in the first instance, instance. by definition, uh, prophets are teaching us how to um, perform the faith. And the Quran itself talks about the function of Prophet Muhammad as being a teacher. Now I'm going to requote the chapter that I've mentioned earlier. I'm going to read for you the translation. He is the one, Allah or God, <clears throat> who raised for the illiterate people a messenger from among themselves, Arabs from among themselves, reciting to them his revelations from God, purifying them through acts of worship and teaching them, teaching them the book, the Quran and wisdom, practice of the book. For indeed, they had previously been clearly astray. Arabs used to be polytheists, used to be doing all sorts of bad things. Uh, and if you want to ask later, I will tell you what some of the bad things are. Uh, but uh, the teaching here is emphasized by this chapter of the Quran, this verse, especially verse number two of chapter 62. He was a teacher. He was a teacher. Now, how was he a teacher? Uh, I'm going to use um, a few extracts of this nice book that I also recommend uh, called Learning and Teaching about Islam. Essays in Understanding, edited by Caroline Elwood. And this is a book from 2012. And there's a chapter in this book, chapter seven, by uh, the last name Abdul Halim. Abdul Halim is actually a first name. Abdul Halim, um, he, the title of his chapter is The Prophet Muhammad as a Teacher, Lessons from the Hadith. So I'm going to probably intersperse my, uh, my, my talk with a few quotes from this chapter. Uh, to show you how the Prophet was a really a great teacher. So first of all, when you are a teacher, you want to be soft to your students. You want to have a soft approach. You don't teach by forcing people. You don't uh, beat knowledge into people's brains. That's impossible to do. And that's actually counterproductive when you force people to learn. Um, that will not work. They will probably be frustrated. You'll probably teach them fear, but not something you will probably not be achieving your results. So here's the story of what happened in the mosque. Anas ibn Malik reported, this is a, a narrator, someone who reports. He was a companion also of the Prophet, peace be upon him. While we were in the mosque with a messenger of Allah, a Bedouin, someone who is constantly traveling, who doesn't have connections to any particular city, a Bedouin came and stood urinating in the mosque. What happened? Reaction of the companions, they were horrified. The companions of the Messenger of Allah said, Mah, Mah, 
harsh way of rebuking. They were actually rebuking him, trying to make him stop his act. So what happened? The prophet came and he said to them, do not interrupt him, leave him alone. So they left him until he had finished urinating. Then the messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, called him and said, these mosques are not a place to throw any kind of filth urinate or defecate. They are only for remembering Allah, praying and reading the Quran. Okay, so these no, these mosques look at the teaching of the Prophet peace be upon him. He didn't do anything harsh to him. He said, just let him finish what he has to do. Let him finish. And then he called him and said, come, I want to tell you something. These mosques are not a place to throw any kind of filth, urinate or defecate. They are only for remembering Allah, praying and reading the Quran. Okay. Then what happened? It doesn't end there. He commanded a man, someone else, not this Bedouin. He didn't ask the Bedouin to clean his mess. He said to another person, bring a bucket of water and throw it over the urine. And he did so. So subhanAllah, soft approach, a soft approach. Okay. Um, why was this effective? Because this Bedouin mentioned in the Hadith was in the process of learning how to practice the faith. He might have been ignorant. He might have low knowledge. So he just entered the fold of Islam. He, he didn't really know anything about the practices of Islam. Maybe he, he made this mistake without knowing. So um, in dealing with him, the Prophet, peace be upon him, did not reprimand, did not use harsh words, did not criticize, did not make sarcastic remarks. And he also did not punish or beat him. So he didn't even say you. He just said, the purpose of this mosque is this. It's not made for this. He didn't even say you did this. Don't do that. Okay. So th this is excellent for people who are interested in pedagogy and teaching and conveying. If someone makes a mistake, you don't recommend them. You tell them, let me show you how it's done. Let me show you why we use this or why we do that. Okay. Another part of his teaching is that uh, I, I call it the peace piecemeal teaching approach. This is not a term used by the book, but I used it myself because I thought that was appropriate or adequate. The piecemeal teaching approach is Prophet Muhammad was sparing and he would only teach the Muslims a little at a time so as not to overload them with information. Okay. So for instance, as a matter of fact, when he spoke, it was often the case that you could count the words he uttered. Uh, what we call too much information? No, he wouldn't overload uh, people with information. And this conforms with the standard of Arab nobility. And I think Chinese culture is, uh, has that too, where a man of dignity and status would speak only very little, but say wise things when he does. Something economical, but wise. <laughs> people who stay a long time silent but when they speak they will give you gems they will give you pearls of wisdom so the prophet had that quality with of course all of these qualities and attributes of the prophets are with the permission of god he put those qualities in him and when he talked he had this economical speech where he would say a few wise things won't speak that often but he will say a few wise things when he does and um, this can be called eloquent conciseness, eloquent conciseness. Now, you know, when you are teaching, um, the, the student's attention span goes in cycles uh, or peaks. They will have 10 minutes of attention peak. And then for, for whatever reason, the peak will go down. It can be fatigued, it can be hungry, it can be whatever. And then you have another 10 minutes of tension and the peak will go down. So you cannot teach uh, by just talking, 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 talking and expect students to catch all the information. You have to be concise sometimes to use things which they will keep, you know, by using uh, signposts, by using flags, by reminding them things which will uh, be kept in their memories. And eloquent conciseness is one of the attributes or characteristics of the prophet's speech. And in Arabic, this eloquent conciseness is called Jawami uh, al-Kalim. Jawami al-Kalim. And this, um, in fact, is um, attested to by 
one of the prophet's uh, narrations. He said himself, uh, or Abu Hurairah, another one of the companions said, I heard Allah's messenger peace be upon him saying, I have been sent with Jawami al kalim the shortest expression, expression carrying the widest meanings. So this is a, a gift or a skill that the prophet has. And I was make, made victorious with all cast into the hearts of the enemy. And while I was sleeping, the keys of the treasures of the earth were brought to me and were put in my hand. Muhammad said, coming back to this Jawami al kalim Kalim, sorry. Muhammad said, Jawami al Kalim means that Allah expresses in one or two statements or thereabouts the numerous matters that used to be written in the books revealed before the coming of the Prophet. It means all the pearls or gems of wisdom can be carried out in a few concise words or expressions. So, in fact, sometimes we find um, narrations of people, they come to the Prophet with a long question and the prophet's answer would be a simple yes no need to elaborate further you actually know more than you think you know so here's an example um a man came to the prophet peace be upon him and asked him if i perform the obligatory prayer number one if i pay the zakat which is the alms due if i fast in ramadan and if i did the hajj but nothing else I only do these things. Would I enter paradise? So this man was curious. And he had this question to the prophet and he said, if I do all of these things, would I enter paradise? The prophet said simply, yes. You already know what you need to do. I don't need to elaborate on that. Okay, conciseness of speech and clear uh, teaching because you actually know. You actually know it already. I don't need to tell you more. You already know it's in your mind. Um, <laughs> when I was, uh, I remember in Singapore, uh, there was actually the Ministry of Education recommended to teachers to use this formula, teach less, learn more. I think it resonates quite well. I don't know how people do that, but as you can see, the example is you don't have to teach too much to uh, allow your students to learn. Sometimes you have to give them the exact amount of exposure to, to that type of knowledge. Uh, don't overload them with information. Teach less, learn more. Okay, so let's continue. Now, another dimension of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a teacher, um, he knew when to introduce new material and when not to. When to say things and when not to, to refrain from talking. So he would select only suitable moments to teach. Uh, when the times or circumstances required him to refrain from speaking, he would remain silent. So there is a narration that says, in one incident, he stated, do not ask me about things on which I remain silent. Don't make things too difficult for yourselves. If I didn't say anything about this matter, don't ask me about it. It means that probably you have to understand that it's not the way to go. Don't do it. Or don't ask me, don't elaborate further. Okay, so that was learning when to teach and learning when not to speak or not to teach things. Just, uh, you know, that was also part of his wisdom in teaching. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is how Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, as a teacher, he taught through cumulative steps and progressive steps. As you, as you progress, he would teach you more things. So um, as we will see later in the last part of today's lecture, he was merciful. He had this quality of mercy when conveying the message. And everything is intertwined, you know, all of these points can be related, to be honest. So when he uh, taught his companions, and then when it was the time for his companions to teach other people, he would say to them, when he was sending other companions to teach other communities far away, he would send delegations of people, for instance, who memorized the Quran to teach them or who knew about Islam to teach other people about Islam. He would say he would give them the following guidelines. First, call on them to believe in one God. First, if they believe in that, then progressive step, call on them to perform the prayers. So after they believe, if they believe, then ask them or invite them to act on their belief, not just to say they believe. Ask them to do the prayers. And if they do that, or if they obey you doing that, then call on them to give 
the charity. So community steps or progressive steps, teaching by progressive steps, not everything in one package, because that can be intimidating for someone. Um, you know, when someone is not used to a lifestyle, when someone is not used to a new practice or a new faith, bombarding them with uh, must do's, it's like a buck, bucket list of things to do if you want to be a Muslim. They can be intimidating or even discouraging. So he said, first, did they believe in one God? There has to be the firm ground. If they do, then tell them a bit about prayers. That's part of our belief system. And if they do that, then tell them that also giving in charity is part of our faith. So you see community steps in teaching. The next thing that the prophet uh, was ex excellent as is that he ar uh, aroused interest. And he used a number of interactive methods. I'm going to tell you, as a teacher, this is very uh, quite appealing for us. Also, if you are teachers or interested in teaching, it can be very appealing to you. So he proceeded by Q&A. He was qu asking questions to them and answering questions. So a frequent technique the prophet used was to ask people questions to make them think. They would reflect first on the question, then put forward the answers. And then he would comment on the answer. So he asked them to, he asked them to think, then they would think, they would reflect, they would answer him, and then he would comment on their answer. For instance, here's an example. He would ask them a question like this. He say, do you know who is the bankrupt person? Tell me, who is the bankrupt person? And then the companions would think, hmm, bankrupt. Someone who is bankrupt. So... For instance, the companions say, okay, this is the information we know. The bankrupt among us is the one who has neither money nor property. That's someone who is bankrupt. He has nothing. Uh, this now, he's going to give them the answer. And he will show them or he will uh, push them to think outside the box. You are thinking in financial terms. Actually, the bankrupt is not just the financially bankrupt. And he would give his answer. The real bankrupt of my ummah or of my community of Muslims would be the one who would come on the day of judgment having the following. He has performed his prayers. He has fasted. Salah is prayer. Saum is fast, fasting. Sadaqah, he would give in charity. So this person has lots of good things, right? He would come on the day of judgment with all these great things, performing prayer, fasting, and giving in charity. But he will find himself or herself bankrupt on that day because he would have exhausted or spent all his good deeds. Why? He would have backbitten someone, reviled people. He would have brought calumny to others. He would have devoured the wealth of people unlawfully, shed the blood of others and beat others. So although he is practicing the faith in terms of all of those pillars, but he still has done lots of misdeeds that all of those good deeds have been taken away uh, from him. They, they were credited to his account as if there's a balance and then he's spending his good deeds on bad things. And then when he comes on the day of judgment, he would be bankrupt. In fact, he will give away his bad, his bad all his good deeds as a payment and then because he has no more good deeds, he will take the bad deeds of others and he's bankrupt. He's not financially bankrupt, but he is spiritually bankrupt. So that was the way of teaching an interactive method, not just telling them, but asking them and making them think. Another method, which was also interactive is the aids to memory. Um, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him used to use a lot of aids to memory. For instance, he was adept at using aids, for instance, uh, on, um, number of points. He used to use uh, odd numbers, three, five. Uh, these are the most common. And he used to ask questions like these. He will say, Islam was built on five pillars. We call this um, mnemotic, mnemotic way of remembering five. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Well, let's remember. It's either mnemotic or not really mnemotic, but five ways. Okay, let me try to remember those five. That's an aid to memory. Or he would say, take advantage of five before five. Make sure you take advantage of five things before five things come. For instance, take advantage of your youth before your old age. 
take advantage of being young before your old age comes, that's one. Number two, take advantage of your free time before you become busy. Take advantage of your wealth before your wealth expires. Right, so there's three and then four and five, um, I, will, I will show you in the PowerPoint later. Three things uh, will make a man a thorough hypocrite. He will say to his companions, there are three things which are signs of a hypocrite person, hypocritical person. So they were curious to say, okay, what are these three things that are a sign of a hypocrite? Number one, when he speaks, he lies. That's a sign of a hypocrite. Number two, when he promises you, he will break his promise. Number three, when he is trusted, he will break his trust. So these are three signs. So the way of arranging the, these teachings into numbers, odd numbers, three, five, seven, uh, was a very good way for people uh, to keep that information stored. And it will make listeners eager to get the right number. Okay, I know there's five. I think I probably skipped two. I must remember now. And it also was a further motivation to memorize this information from the Prophet, peace be upon him. Okay, another method um, uh, by the Prophet, peace be upon him, uh, is pausing. This, if you are a teacher, you know that's so effective. <clears throat> when he taught things, he used to pause. So before giving an answer, the Prophet would pause to arouse curiosity. For instance, there are three persons. This is from one of the narrations. He said, there are three persons God, Allah, will not speak to on the day of judgment. And he repeated it three times, right? There are three persons God will not speak to on the day of judgment. There are three persons God will not speak to on the day of judgment. So the fact of repeating also is very characteristic of teachers. And then one of the companions was so um, curious, Abu Dharr, he said, Oh my God, these three people are lost. They actually are not going to be able to speak to God on the day of judgment. Who are they, Prophet of Allah? Please tell us. Who are they? Can you tell us who are they? And then the Prophet would reply, um, the answer, I have it, in fact, in the, in the notes. One of them is the, uh, the unjust leader. And the, oh, first is the old person who commits illicit sexual acts. The second is um, an unjust leader. And the third, um, I actually want to give you the answer because I don't want to. Yeah, so a ruler, uh, uh, first is an aged man who commits illicit sexual act, a ruler who lies, and a proud poor person. What does that mean, a proud poor person? Someone who is poor, but he is arrogant. He is arrogant, he's not modest. He, although he, has, he is destitute, but he thinks, um, you know, he is, everything, all that and a bag of chips. Okay, so finally today, to, to end today's talk, um, I'm going to talk about the prophet, uh, prophet's quality as a prophet of mercy. And uh, this was taught through his sayings, but also through his acts. And as you can see from this um, hadith or this narration on the right section of your screen, the messenger, peace be upon him, said, he who does not show mercy to people, Allah does not show mercy to him. So, in fact, you give what you receive. Do you want to receive mercy from your creator? Start by showing mercy to the people. So this is what uh, he used to teach to people. Show mercy if you want to be given mercy. Okay. Now, mercy, this point of mercy is um, illustrated in different aspects of the prophet's life. And it shows us his quality of mercy. In the holy book of Allah, in the Quran, um, sorry, in the Quran, uh, Allah says to us, and he is talking to the prophet, but also making us witness of this. He says, وَمَا أَرْسَلَّاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ and we have, or we have sent you, O Prophet, only as a mercy for the whole world, for the worlds, for the whole world, we have sent you as a mercy. So this has been inside the Prophet as a quality given by God, that he is merciful to mankind, to the whole world. Now, why is the Prophet so merciful? First of all, in terms of flexibility. 
One of the companions of the Prophet called Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, reported. The Prophet, peace be upon him, said, make things easy and do not make them difficult. This giving instructions to his companions, make things easy and do not make things difficult or make them difficult. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru. This is the Arabic version. It follows, cheer the people up by conveying happy news of Islam, giving them eternal bliss. Cheer the people up by conveying glad tidings to them and do not repulse them, do not turn them away. Yassiru wa la tu'assiru, bashiru wa la tunaffiru. Okay, that's the second part. So this was actually instructions. If you want to teach people about Islam, first of all, make them easy. Make things easy on them. Don't give them too many restrictions. Give them, show them how our faith is easy. And also give them some happy news of what is to come. Okay, flexibility and mercy to the people. Don't be so harsh. Now, second dimension, which is beautiful if you are a father or a mother, <clears throat> is how he used to be with children. Um, his mercy, in fact, extended to all ages, not just to the young ones. But starting with the young ones, to the very young ones, to children. One time, uh, there was a Bedouin, or there was a man who came to the Prophet. According to Aisha's report and her narration, she said that one day, a man came to the Prophet, a Bedouin. And he said to the Prophet, he was asking the Prophet because, you know, everybody got their knowledge from the Prophet and he was so approachable. Anyone could just come and ask him questions to know. So he said to the Prophet, Prophet, do you kiss your children? This was just a genuine, simple, simple question that the, the Bedouin asked him. Do you kiss your children? And Prophet Muhammad said, yes, I do. I kiss my children. Now, the reaction of the Bedouin is the following following. He said, but by Allah, we never kiss our children. We never do that. <laughs> As if it's kind of a sign of weakness for this Bedouin to claim that, why should I kiss my children? We never do that. It's a sign of not being a man or something, right? So the Bedouin said, we never do that. So what was the reply of the Prophet, peace be upon him? He said, what can I do if Allah has taken away mercy from you? So kissing your children is showing them mercy, right? So he said, in other words, do it. If you want to be merciful to your kids, show them a sign of love, kiss them. That's one of the signs of love towards your kids is to kiss them. Show them you care for them, right? So he said, if you don't do it, I mean, what can I do for you? If, you, if Allah has taken away mercy from you, I feel sorry for you. Okay, so that's, that's indirectly saying to him, well, you're not right. You're not doing the right thing. Okay, then moving on from children to all the people, to the elderly. Uh, the Prophet said, he is not one of us. He's not one of us who does not have mercy on our young, meaning the younger ones, the children, but also does not have respect for our elders, right? So you see, it's not only the young, but all ages, but especially the young and the elderly. He said, he's not of us. He's, he cannot say, he cannot claim to be a Muslim. If you say that you are Muslim, a real Muslim, then you have to have mercy on children and have respect for the elderly. You have to have respect for the elderly. Okay. All right. Now, coming back, I'm, I'm almost done, actually, and then we'll have a nice chance to uh, ask questions. I don't want to leave too little time, but uh, I'm almost done. So as far as neighbors are concerned, um, um, part of honoring neighbors, in fact, is also part, it, it is it's a tradition of Arabic uh, Arabs, and I think many Muslims around the world have this beautiful quality of honoring the neighbors. And there is, um, because of our Islamic traditions, before Islam and after Islam, there is a lot of tradition of honoring neighbors. And there is an Arabic saying that says, al jar qabla dar the, the neighbor before the house. Even before considering to have your house, you have to think about making, extending good relations with your neighbors. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, has this famous saying, and it's parallel to the previous saying. He says, uh, uh, Ibn Abbas uh, informed Ibn Az-Zubayr, this is a chain of narrations by different reporters or, or of uh, companions who are reporting the speech that they heard. They said, I heard the Prophet, may Allah be, uh, may Allah's blessing, uh, bless him and grant him peace, say the following. He is not a believer, or he is not one of us, the same as the previous one. 
whose stomach is filled, meaning he is full, he feels full, but his neighbor is hungry. He cannot say that he is a Muslim. That person who is full at home, he's eating, filling his belly, but while in his neighborhood, someone is starving or is hungry, that you cannot say you're a Muslim if you are inconsiderate to your neighbor, if you don't care about your neighbor. So showing a mercy to the closest people, uh, starting with our neighbors. You don't have to go too far. Sometimes people give in charity to people in the distant countries. That's very good. That's very good. We encourage that to give in charity to people in, in countries which have, uh, which have difficult situations or are disfavored. But start by your family and your neighbors. There's an English saying that says, charity starts at home. So look at your neighbors. Why do you have to reach far? And the prophet says, if you have a filled stomach, but your neighbor is starving, you cannot say you're a believer. That's unfair of you. You have to do it. You have to take care of your neighbor before even thinking about filling your own belly uh, full. Okay. Now I'm done with today's session and I hope that I didn't really um, extend my time. So I can actually stop now and let you answer, let you ask rather questions. Inshallah, Jazakallah khairan, Brother Salim, for your presentation. So now it is time for Q&A. We have uh, less than 10 minutes, so uh, feel free to ask your questions um, through the audio or the chat box. Assalamualaikum. Alaikum assalam. Um, I have one question. Um, Okay, so I, I, I want to know when the Prophet Muhammad meets a non-Muslim, like how he managed to teach or convince people to believe. Because, you know, for us Muslim, it's when we talk to other Muslim, it's very easy for us to understand the concept in Islam because somehow you can say that, okay, Muslim believe in the Quran because mm -hmm. they believe in the Prophet. And then... Uh, a Muslim believe in the prophet because it is stated or mentioned in the Quran. You know, it's like maybe for an atheist, it's like chicken and egg question. So maybe it's quite hard to let the atheist to understand this. So, uh, so I'm just very curious about how is if you just say, oh, it's because his personality, the way he treat people, is very good and and all that, and he do all the good stuff to all his neighboring and all that, but. Uh, I mean, an atheist can also do that. So, I mean, I this is one of the questions I received by an atheist. That's so why I'm just curious how how the prophet um, convey the message to the non-believer that you know the I think it's quite hard to make them believe. So I'm just wondering through his quality of teaching, since he's so uh, he has so much wisdom in 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 teaching, he's a good teacher. So I'm just wondering how. Yeah, how is that? How he did that? Thank you. This is a very good question. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, so I, what I understand is that uh, both the prophet and his companions and also the later generations, um, they were teaching not necessarily by acting um, or asking people to do things or to um, maybe to debate too much with them. Uh, the science of debate is actually relatively recent. Uh, so there was no like huge debates like we see now broadcasted on YouTube uh, of two, three hours of debating interfaith debate and all that. Um, simply, I think that there's observation of the behavior of the prophet and be, being inspired by his lifestyle and his manners you know, uh, of how, how um, Islam made him behave in such a way and then also other people were so charmed by or seduced by the lifestyle of Muslims that they really were rushing to actually embrace the faith. Uh, and this happened a lot in uh, Southeast Asia, South and Southeast Asia, where when they saw those, um, the traders who came um, to trade, to do business uh, with uh, the local population, they, they didn't, <laughs> then this, 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 uh, this um, uh, how to say it, uh, there's always this uh, idea, this false idea that Islam was spread by the sword, right? But 
So the majority of the Muslims around the world are located in this part of the world. I would call, I would say Indonesia and India and, and other countries around uh, not far from here. And in these countries, actually Islam was spread through trade, through trade. And what happened is that these people came, they were actually equipped with Islam, they were already Muslims. And their lifestyles, the way they were, their kindness, uh, all of the, their practice of their faith, um, attracted others to embrace Islam. So I think people sometimes, um, they underestimate our behavior. Uh, you know, we carry Islam on our sleeves. We are, our, we are representative of Islam. Sometimes through our misbehavior, people can actually be turned off by the thing. But also through our behavior, people can be really, really attracted to our faith. So I think that's also something um, that happened during the Prophet's time, peace be upon him that uh, and if we look back at the history of Medina, people embraced Islam even before meeting the Prophet. So they had lots of echoes about the stories of the Prophet and what he was like, the type of person he was. What did he do? I mean, what, how did he behave with the people and what was the message he was carrying? Now, another thing is probably another parenthesis. When we teach our children, what is the most effective way of teaching them? Do they hear, do they listen to us when, they, when we tell them to do something? Or do they, <laughs> do they listen to us when they see us doing something? So for instance, if daddy doesn't smoke and if daddy smokes and tells his kids to not smoke, will they listen to him? Well, they will be, a, he is a role model, the father of a man. But even if you tell me don't smoke, you are doing it, right? So I'm gonna follow what you do. If I love you, I will follow you. And then many people also love the prophet, his character. And they wanted to be like him. So he taught by his personality, you know, his way of being. So I would like to also turn to Brother Raza and others uh, who actually can maybe complement um, this question, this answer. Brother well, Salim, you have covered everything that there is nothing much oh, to Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot, a lot to say. Um, yeah, so I think that um, debating is good because, you know, it uh, sometimes people need to... Um, uh, rationally or cognitively be convinced about why Islam is the truth, you know, you need to explain to them and to share with them or question them, you know, you don't even have to tell them, just ask them questions, you know, where will you go after you die? What will happen to you? You just ask that question. Some people will stay the whole night awake trying to answer that question. Um, and then um, if, you, if you engage them and if you ask them questions and if you just don't try to push or force faith because remember Quran says La ikraha fi din. you cannot force people to believe the heart you know it's very difficult to you know the heart is in the thorax here no one can trap the heart you can you can actually chain someone put them in jail but you cannot trap their free will and many people at the time of the prophet they didn't need proofs they didn't need proofs to believe one of them is Abu Bakr uh, another one is Ali, his cousin. Another one is uh, his first wife, Khadija. She believed without proofs. But some people, you bring them all the proofs of the world, they will never believe. So you have two different paradigms. Here. People need lots of proofs, but they yet not, don't believe. And other people feel this is the truth, and they believe instantly or immediately. So yeah, okay. Uh, let me just stop and see if you have anything else. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Salim, for the response. And um, Sister Rabina uh, has a, a comment to share. Beautiful presentation. Let me say how beautiful the slides were. Very <laughs> thought provoking, <you>. <laughs> especially like the part where we talked about uh, Prophet Wasallam as a great teacher, subhanAllah. And uh, let's see. Thanks for the presentation by Sister Mahveen. And uh, yeah, there's some comments about how um, akhlaq is important. Setting a good example uh, is, is crucial. And um, yeah. Okay, so any other questions apart from the one that has just been answered? Any other questions? We can make also uh, our emails available for questions post, uh, post talk. If uh, any brothers or sisters or companions here in this session can send us emails, we can do that. I also can provide my email 
Right. So it doesn't have to be limited to the session in the first place. You can go for it. Sure. Yes. Um, yeah, so there is a question from uh, sister by Sister Rabina. Other okay. than the one, the book, the, 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 I think there were two books that you've mentioned in your presentation. One is the Sealed Nectar, uh -huh. and uh, one is the, uh, the book, uh, the teaching. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot what the name of the book. Oh, yes. Let me go back. I, I, I remember. I know what you mean. Yeah. Um, that's, I think that's a good reference as well. It's here. Yeah, right there. It's slide 18. Yeah, learning and teaching about Islam, essays and understanding. So the uh -huh. question is that, are there any other books that you would recommend for uh, yes. teachers? Yes, I have lots of books and um, I, I had, I have some books in my, on my bookshelves. Um, some of them have to do with children's education mm. um, and Islamic perspective and others have to do with other things like uh, speech. Uh, being a good public speaker, but uh, it depends on what's your interest, to be honest. If you are a teacher, I can suggest other references later. I can send you a list. So okay, we can sure. do that by email if you want. Yeah. Okay, sure. Uh, Brother Salim, uh, do you want to share your email to the yes, or I'll do you write it now. Okay. So uh, here's my email. I'll do it here, for example. Sumabs at gmail.com. You can send me an email anytime. I'd be happy to reply to you and we can get some uh, sharing going, conversation. Yeah, great. Nice. A any other questions from anyone else? Okay, as I say, not having questions can mean two things. Either you understand everything or you don't understand anything. <laughs> no, I'm joking. No, but just go yeah, on. We can, we can follow up later with uh, the questions online and Brother Raza uh, and uh, me can, and also Brother Adnan can answer uh, your questions. Happily, we can do that. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Salim. And uh, just on a closing note, um, uh, I would like to inform all the participants that Adnan will shortly send, yes, he has just sent you the, um, the link for the evaluation, uh, which we do it for ev after every session, so that we can share the comments, the feedback by the audience to the speaker respectively. And thank you so much for uh, giving your feedback for the first, second session, and uh, this is the third session. And um, the other thing I have to mention is that the next session will also be same time next Saturday. Um, uh, it will be entitled as um, Hadith and its Collection Processes, uh, according to my memory, which will be presented by Brother Arif. And uh, Brother Arif is a, uh, an Indonesian uh, well-known speaker here in Hong Kong. Uh, Brother Salim, I think you have met him as well. Yes, of course, brother. Yes, Arifa, no, no. yes. Mashallah. And, uh, mashallah. Very, very, very knowledgeable person as well. And uh, so uh, I'm sure everyone is excited to know the collection processes and the status of hadith in, uh, in Islam. And uh, I'm sure, uh, you know, we'll be looking forward to that as well. Uh, Adnan, is there anything else you would like to add? Uh, we couldn't hear you, Adnan. Maybe you're, uh, you're you're presently muted. Oh, sorry, I didn't realize. Yeah. Okay. So there's nothing else to add from you. I'll just stop the recording in the live broadcast now. Okay. Um, anybody else have to say anything?